was tough on, on Nora to watch Joyce going out and order 30 books. Tough to watch Joyce decide he was going to become a tenor and enroll in the local conservatory of music and buy, you know, chest expanders and, and, and waste money there. Tough to watch Joyce, for example, in 1908, go to the Teatro Verdi eight times in ten days to see a performance of La Boheme by Puccini. By 1906, The Dubliners was finished, but Joyce was accused of writing blasphemous and indecent material. Unable to publish and heavily in debt, Joyce would drown his sorrows in drinking bouts and late nights at the opera. With little teaching work and desperate for funds, Joyce turned to emotional blackmail. In 1905, Joyce and Nora gave birth to their son, Giorgio. But they were almost starving in Trieste and heavily in debt. So Joyce, the arch manipulator, went to work. He wrote to his brother Stanislaus, his younger brother, and said, come here, there is work. So Stanislaus came. So they had a menage a trois. And which again, Joyce needed him. They needed Stanislaus as a babysitter and they needed his income, which he contributed to the household and Stanislaus was more reliable than Joyce. So the money came in was Joyce tended to spend his. Joyce had no shame in using his brother, like Nora, to further his own genius. There are things in his private life that are horrible. His treatment of his brother, of Stanislaus, who basically was his slave here for 10 years. You know, and then Joyce can write in Ulysses, a brother is as easily forgotten as an umbrella. I mean, on no way can I excuse that comment. It's just unforgivable. Joyce exploited him in many ways, kept him perhaps from setting up with a family of his own. He just, he, uh, Joyce played a lot of dirty tricks on Stanislaus. Stanley was aware and would complain about Joyce's drinking. Presumably Stanley would be the one who would carry him home at night. Um, who would listen to Nora shout at him and, and threaten yet again to leave him or threaten, God forbid, to bring the children to Mass because this was another one of her ploys to try and bring him into line and that, that often worked as well. On July the 27th, 1907, Nora gave birth to a girl, Lucia, after the patron saint of eyesight. Ironically, it was at this time Joyce's own eyesight began to fail him. Joyce was now writing in new, forbidden territory. It was a meticulous world of mental anguish and erotic fantasies. But his frustrations with his work often left him drunk in the gutters of Trieste. Joyce was, I think, very much a man of his time. Like most men of his time, his sexual initiation was with prostitutes. This lasted for a long time. His sexual education was with prostitutes. And uh, even as an adult, and after his relationship with Nora and so I mean, there's no way to prove it, but the evidence seems to indicate that every time he left Nora, when he went to Dublin in 1909, he apparently got gonorrhea. Legitimate sex was in the family, and it was for procreation. Real sex, pleasure, desire, gratification, was with prostitutes. And Joyce fit very much into his profile. In 1909, Joyce returned to Ireland with the Dubliners, determined to be published and be damned. Joyce was back in Dublin, uh, and he, he, he looked up uh, Byrne, and he looked up uh, Cosgrave. He, he completely snubbed uh, Gogarty, and it was mainly Cosgrave that he spent a lot of time with, uh, mainly drinking, done in the bars and the pubs, and that was a big mistake. He told Joyce that all the time that he'd been courting Nora, Cosgrave had actually had been taking her out on, the, on the, her days off, as it were. She was the only thing he could really depend upon in his life, he felt. And now suddenly it seemed that she'd betrayed him, and with Cosgrave of all people. Cosgrave's story was malicious and untrue, but Joyce's paranoia and jealousy over Nora were ignited. Nora, to reassure him, began writing a series of the most passionate and obscene letters. And uh, he wrote very explicit letters back to her, describing what they used to do, what he was going to do to her next time they met. She seemed to have enjoyed this sex game, and in fact, she seems to have initiated it, wrote the first letter, she thought, perhaps to uh, keep him from going to prostitutes. I don't think they're dirty letters at all. No, they're not. They're the letters of people who love each other. Uh, and they ache for that physical, sexual contact of love. Uh, and it's the uh, equivalent of telephone sex, in a way. Uh, they're uh, separated by distance from each other, but they're trying to keep in touch sexually. He saw himself as a sinner, 
and definitely saw himself on the side of the devil. He, he knew there was this sort of obscene side to him and, and, and a sort of bestial side to him, but that was all part of his artistic program. Meanwhile, The Dubliners was going nowhere. Due to its obscenity, the publishers insisted on cuts. Joyce refused. On September the 11th, 1912, Joyce left Dublin forever. All artists have to be monsters because they have to be driven by this force that makes them complete their art. Their art becomes the most, the only significant element of their life. Every other ordinary human consideration, like holding down a job, cutting the grass, being a good husband, all this is put to one side in pursuit of his art. Joyce was in many ways an impossible man to live with. But one thing Nora could be sure of was he loved her. He assured her of that, and it seems to have been true his whole life. And in that, she had to build on that and hope on that. He appears certainly to have been very much in love with her and was devastated by any notion of her infidelity. It was quite clear to him um, from their first date when she performed a certain sexual act, he realized probably it wasn't the first time she had done that and he realized she had a sexual past which he had hardly at all except for some brothels. Joyce was always paranoid about any possibility of Nora's sexual infidelity. Joyce was a literary experimenter and in this he was almost like a scientist and whereas he was devastated by any prospect of Nora actually being unfaithful he did in certain circumstances orchestrate situations uh, where he could experience at some level, uh, the pangs of jealousy, so that he could write about it. Joyce had decided to play a devilish erotic game with his best friend in Trieste, Roberto Prezioso, and Nora. This is the intriguing thing about Joyce. He realized, stirring up these emotions in himself, he could then use them for writing. And finally, Nora said in despair to a friend in Zurich, that Jim wants me to go with other men so he can write about it. I don't understand the motivation behind it. I think he liked the idea of Nora being desirable to other men. And perhaps it was a period when she wasn't particularly desirable to him. And maybe it was a way of, of giving energy back to his desire, if you like, for Nora. Joyce was infatuated with wireistic images of sexual liaisons. It's an affair of the eye in which Joyce is working, is, is like a voyeur, gazing at these women in adoration from various different positions at the same time being terrified of them and being terrified of the sexual power that they have over him. And in the end, he just puts something down like, write it, damn you, and be done with it. And he decides to make fiction of this very personal encounter or series of encounters that he had. The turbulent Trieste years had given birth to Joyce's great novels, The Dubliners and The Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. Joyce's next work exploded literature's greatest bombshell it was to be banned as obscene and prosecuted for indecency. By 1915, the world was at war. James Joyce and his family had moved from Trieste to the safety of Zurich, Switzerland. Joyce was tormented by the world around him. Inspired by Homer's epic Greek poem, he began writing his revolutionary novel, Ulysses. The thing that shocks people about Ulysses is the frankness of its sexuality and the frustrations of that sexuality, of the, the, the sheer nature of, of the lust and of the desire that a man can feel and also a woman can feel. Joyce's eyesight was failing him and his arthritis was so painful that his daily anaesthetic of cocaine and absinthe was no longer working. By 1917, Joyce had an anonymous benefactor, a champion of avant-garde literature, Harriet Weaver. She offered to send him $200 a year. I think Joyce's relations with Harriet Weaver are fascinating. Uh, suddenly money appeared out of nowhere. Out of some, uh, she actually had published a Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, which came out in 1914. And uh, she was an, an English spinster feminist publisher and recognized this genius and she had money and she believed that personal wealth was a uh, sin and so Joyce was just, it was the logical one to help her get over that guilt. She was a financial masochist. She enjoyed selling off her shares and giving them, I mean at one stage she says, dear Mr. Joyce, I've given away all my shares to you and all the rest of it, I have no more money, but I do have a house. Would you like me to sell it? You can't do anything for a woman like that. She's pathological and more power to her, thank God for her. 
Over the next 20 years, it is estimated Harriet Weaver gave Joyce nearly $1 million. In 1920, Joyce was invited to visit Paris for a few days by the writer Ezra Pound. He stayed for the next 20 years. By the time Joyce got to Paris, uh, Ezra Pound has, had worked his magic and uh, there was already, he'd already generated a buzz around Joyce. So all Joyce had to do was just arrive and, and be fated by the Paris literati. Joyce met Sylvia Beach, a young American bookshop owner and publisher. This was the focal centre for the avant-garde writers of the time. No publisher would touch Ulysses anywhere in the world, but Sylvia Beach came forward with this plan that uh, it should be published under the Shakespeare & Co imprint. And she gave him an unheard of 60% royalty, which is partly why he also became quite a wealthy man near the end. And it was printed and published in this very expensive limited edition, which was sold sort of all over the world, really. The publication of Ulysses in 1922 produced unprecedented outrage and disgust. The plot of Ulysses is simple. The events of a single day in Dublin on Thursday the 16th of June 1904, the day Joyce met Nora. It follows the adventures of a young artist, Stephen Daedalus, back from Paris, and a middle-aged Irish Jew, Leopold Bloom. It had taken 16 years of thinking and seven years of tormented writing. To own a copy of Ulysses was a criminal offence, and uh, in the States and in Britain, uh, you know, people were searching the post and pulling out copies and confiscating them. Um, it, was, it was seen as a very dangerous book. Many thought it obscene. To others, it was dirty but beautiful. In Dublin, many asked, am I in it? To Joyce, there was nothing that couldn't be written about. And this was true throughout his life, he said, merely and mildly. If Ulysses is not fit to read, then life isn't fit to live because there was nothing in Ulysses that wasn't occurring every day around the city of Dublin, but people just weren't prepared to face it. In 1931, James Joyce and Nora Barnacle married in a London registry office. Which was an enormous shock to Nora's family in Galway, because they believed, as Joyce told everybody, they'd been married in 1904. He needed to make his will, and he needed to legitimize his children. He was barnacled up to his eyes as he wrote in his final novel, Finnegan's Wake. On the 13th of January 1941, aged 58, Joyce died in Zurich after surgery on a duodenal ulcer. He tried to write about human life in all of its various different aspects in a very upfront way. So initially scandalous in Ireland for the open sexuality that's expressed in his writing, for his open criticism of sacred cows in Ireland like nationalism and Catholicism and the combination of both of those things. In 2004, Ireland celebrated the centenary of James Joyce's life and work. The prodigal son had come home. Maybe Joyce couldn't be controlled by the forces of orthodoxy and the people that want to hold everything back and make everything easy for mass consumption. But Joyce himself was in control. He was in control of everything. He knew exactly what was going on.